In Guyana, Brazil, two men broke into an abandoned hospital and stole what they thought was some valuable scrap metal, but turned out to contain a capsule of highly radioactive cesium chloride, which had been used in radiotherapy. Dismantling the component at home, one of the men found a glowing powder inside, which he tried to light, thinking it might be a type of gunpowder, before selling the parts on for scrap, whereupon the owner of the scrapyard took the capsule home containing the strange glowing material and started extracting bits to give us curiosities to his friend and family. The Guyana accident, as it has become known, became one of the world's worst nuclear contamination disasters, with four fatalities, including a six-year-old girl, daughter of one of the scrapyard employees, who was given the glowing powder to play with, and 249 others required hospital treatment after a major effort to examine some 112,000 people. Choreographer and all-round musical star Bob Fosse died at the age of 60 of a heart attack, at the same time as his revival of Sweet Charity was opening across town. During his glittering career, Fosse had choreographed and directed many hit Broadway musicals and in many cases choreographed and or directed their movie versions, including The Pajama Game, Sweet Charity, Cabaret and All That Jazz. He won the Oscar for Best Director for Cabaret in 1972, which he added to three Emmy Awards and a whole cabinet full of Tonys. And Pope John Paul II arrived in the US for a tour, visiting Los Angeles and San Francisco, where he won plaudits for embracing AIDS sufferers, but also drew criticism for emphasising abstinence from sex and drugs as the best way to prevent infection, rather than condoning the use of contraceptives. The Formula One teams had spent the two weeks between races doing some intensive testing and development. The last two European races of the season were on successive weekends, and there wouldn't be chance to do much during the globetrotting final three races. McLaren and TAG were still working on their engine management software, trying to sort out those misfires. Ferrari were still tweaking the F187, trying to build on their ever-improving results. And Mansell had spent a lot of time at Brands Hatch, trying out the active suspension car, which the team were hoping to make the standard configuration for 1988. And Williams brought four chassis to Estoril with them, one active and one passive for each driver. After some money-based worries, Ligier had managed to secure their supply of Megatron engines until the end of the season, but no word yet on 1988, while the little Colony team stayed at home, though they hoped to rejoin the gang at Jerez. Otherwise, the field was the same as at Monza, as the team set themselves up on the Portuguese Riviera. Last year's winner, Nigel Mansell, really needed to repeat the feat if he was to keep his title hopes alive, while PK could yet put one hand on the trophy if he won and his rivals Mansell and Senna didn't score well. The two Williamses were at the top of Friday's timing sheets, but on Saturday, Gerhard Berger went out and beat them both before it started raining and neither could reply. So, Gerhard Berger had his first career pole position and Ferrari their first since 1985. Mansell was second with Prost third, his engine running much better after the software updates. PK, who hadn't set a time on Saturday at all, lined up fourth, with Senna and Alboreto on row three, then Patrese and Johansson, with the Benettons and Arrowses in their usual spot at the back of the leading group. The Minardis were once again looking decent, the Ligiers once again disappointing, and the normally aspirated cars were glad to see the back of a run of power blast circuits and hoping to be a bit more competitive. Once again, Franco Forini put his Azella in 26th spot, meaning that Pascal Fabra would again miss out on the race. So, on a sunny Portuguese afternoon, all the cars lined up behind Berger for the first time and the lights went green, but the keyed-up Austrian was slightly slow on the getaway and Mansell got ahead, with PK chopping across in front of Senna to go for the inside line at the first turn. A couple of corners later, as the cameras picked up the leaders again, PK was missing and so was Alboreto. They'd touched in turn one, setting off a multiple pile-up involving Warwick, Brundle, Dana, Nakajima, Alio, Chiva, Arnu and a distinctly cheesed-off Campos. The race was clearly going to be stopped, but the black flags weren't waving as Mansell led Berger and Prost across the line at racing speed. Berger overtook Mansell at turn one, only to discover cars all over the track. As the leaders threw out the anchors and passed by slowly, the black flags were finally being waved. So, for the third race in a row, there'd be a restart. Both Zack Speeds had been demolished, and Dana would miss the start with Brundle claiming the spare, and Alboreto, Arnu, Fabi and Chiva were also in their respective spares, while Campos and Streff started from the pit lane. So away they went again, Mansell once again getting the drop on Berger, and Senna squeezing Piquet onto the grass on his way to third behind the Ferrari. Mansell led the field around lap one with no further incidents, with Berger hot on his heels, and just as in the first start, Gerhardt pulled out from behind Mansell on the straight and took the lead. Without debris all over the track this time, he immediately pulled away, while his teammate Alboreto had also moved up, getting ahead of Prost into fifth off-camera. 
PK squeezed ahead of Senna a lap later, by which time there was already a sizeable gap to Mansell. As they came round to finish the lap, Senna suddenly moved over, out of the way, and Alboreto surged through, followed by Prost and Bootsen. Ayrton's engine control software was playing up, and he got moving again in seventh, but it looked like it was going to be a trying afternoon for Lotus. Patrese was the first retirement with a blown BMW, and was quickly joined by Mansell, his own electronics crying enough on lap 14. Senna came in seven laps later to have his engine control unit changed, a long job which lost him three laps and put him back out on the track last but one, so Pico was starting to look like a very good bet for the championship, now running second between the two Ferraris, who were having a great race. Bootsen made an early tyre stop on lap 23 of the 70, as Warwick had a spin out of seventh and lost a lot of ground while he restarted, spun again, nearly collected his teammate and finally got moving. While the cameras were watching all of that, Alboreto had got ahead of PK into second place, and those two, along with Prost, were running close together as all three came flying past Nakajima in the camera equipped Lotus, with PK in the process of retaking second. It was a cracking battle, but not for long as PK came into the pits, leaving Alboreto second once more, some 17 seconds behind Berger. PK rejoined fourth ahead of Fabi, and Prost was in next time around, making a cracking stop to get out ahead of PK. Berger was in next, another good stop, as Alboreto went through into the lead, for the first time in quite some time. On half distance then, it was Ferrari in first and second places, with Alboreto still yet to stop, then Fabi, also not yet stopped, Prost, Piquet and De Cesaris behind. Prost and Piquet were scrapping over fourth behind Fabi and waiting for the Benetton to make his tyre stop and get out of the way as Alboreto came in from the lead. Another great Ferrari stop, they'd been practising them all week, couldn't quite get him out ahead of Prost and PK, but he wasn't far off, as Prost decided he wasn't going to wait for Fabi to stop and snuck inside to take third, with PK following through a little later. Alboreto's miserable season continued with a dud gearbox on lap 39, so Ferrari's hopes rested now on young Berger. But Prost was charging, trading lap records with the Austrian as PK seemed to be dropping back and now had a pair of Benettons trying to drive up his gearbox. All attention was on the front, though, as lap after lap, Prost squeezed the gap down until he had Berger in sight. By lap 64, when he broke the lap record again, he was less than four seconds behind. Berger wasn't hanging around either, of course, and was pushing to keep the gap as the laps ticked down to the end of the race. Pushing too hard, with his tyres on the raggedy edge, because just three laps from the end he spun. He got moving again, but now second. Alain Prost thus took the win. Not undeserved after a great pursuit drive, but still somewhat fortunate. He wouldn't care. It was his 28th win, finally breaking Jackie Stewart's long-standing all-time record. After so much hype earlier in the season, everyone seemed to have almost forgotten about it as McLaren had all sorts of mid-season troubles. Berger would ordinarily have been thrilled with second place, but must have been absolutely furious with himself as he trailed in 20 seconds behind Prost with PK third, and not really making the most of the misfortunes of his title rivals. Fabi took a solid fourth place for Benetton amidst rumours that he would be returning to IndyCar racing next year, Johansson and Chiva had quiet races to pick up the last points, and Senna finished seventh after a good but not quite good enough recovery. Capelli won the junior category again, with Palmer and Straff following. Piquet's third place was actually the lowest he'd finished all year, and was his 11th point score, so starting from the next race in Hereth, he'd have to start discarding points finishes. Nonetheless, he still had a fairly good lead over Senna and Mansell, with Prost still mathematically in the hunt, and certainly threatening to take third from Nigel. McLaren, meanwhile, retook second place from Lotus, but it still very much looked like Williams' title, unless something spectacular happened in the last four races. With barely time to catch their breath, the teams packed up and headed south to Jerez for the Spanish Grand Prix in just a week's time. 